Hello, this is Simon Jackson from LearnLearns.com and this video is all about um, contract law. Well, specifically, it's about the rules on offer and acceptance. Um, so I'm going to be looking at what is an offer and what we mean by an invitation to treat, uh, how offers can be terminated and the rules on the communication of acceptance. Um, first of all, let's just go back to basics a little bit here. Let's just think about the formation of contracts. Are all agreements legally enforceable? They're not. Common sense tells you, for example, that if you agree to go out with a friend to the cinema and later cancel that arrangement, your friend is not able to start legal proceedings. But how does the law distinguish legally enforceable agreements from other sorts of agreement? And well, there's four essential elements that we need to have for something to be regarded as a contract in law. And these essential elements are, number one, offer and acceptance. Uh, number two, what's called consideration, and that means that both parties have exchanged something of value. Number three, there's an intention to be legally bound. And number four, what's called capacity. But we're looking today at offer and acceptance. OK, so um, the person making an offer, just to make it clear, the person making an offer is known as the offeror. The person to whom that offer is made is called the offeree. Uh, now, the moment in time that an offer has been accepted has got a special significance because that's the first time that the contract comes into existence, uh, assuming the other essential elements are present. Until then, the set of promises obligations and rights, in other words, the terms of the contract, don't bind anyone. Once an offer has been accepted, the existence of a contract binds the parties to that contract and gives them legal rights against each other. Now, an offer can be made verbally, in writing, or even by conduct. Uh, you can get behaviour that implies an offer. Although there are certain kinds of contracts that must be in writing to be legally enforceable, um, notably in English or those for the sale of land and some leases, there are very many contracts that, that do not need to be in writing. So what is an offer exactly? Well, um, simple. generally it's a simple enough matter to identify where an offer is being made. There are certain situations, however, that might seem to be offers at first glance, but are not regarded as offers by the courts. So. You know, what do I mean by that? Well, there's something called invitations to treat. If I say to you, would you like to discuss the possibility of selling your car? And you answer yes, it's easy to see that the first question is not an offer. It's merely an invitation to negotiate uh, with terms, such as the price, uh, to be agreed at some later point. Now, a lawyer would describe this, this kind of question would you like to discuss the possibility of selling your car as what's called an invitation to treat? In some situations, um, it may not be easy to see whether something is an, inv an offer sorry, or an invitation to treat. So what about goods displayed on the shelves of a shop? Um, this is normally seen as an invitation to treat. In Pharmaceutical Society in Boots, Boots, the retail chemists, were in dispute with the Pharma Pharmaceutical Society, who argued that setting out goods on self-service shelves was an offer which the customer accepted by removing the goods from the shelf and taking them to a till. Boots argued that taking goods from the shelf to an assistant at a counter was an offer which the assistant, sorry, the assistant was free to accept or reject. And the Court of Appeal agreed um, with that with that point of view. Uh, Lord Somerville says that um, although goods are displayed and it's intended that customers could go and choose what they want, the contract is not completed until the customer takes goods to the till and the shopkeeper or one of the shopkeeper's employees accepts that offer. Okay. Same kind of idea with display of goods in shop windows. That's an invitation to treat. Uh, Fisher and Bell is the case there. Media advertisements. What about advertisements? Advertisements, even if they provide details of the goods, the terms of any proposed contract and the price, are normally seen as invitations to treat. Uh, look at a case called Partridge and Crittenden. But 
There might be a bit of an issue here with unilateral contracts. So unilateral contracts can, uh, in the form of advertisements, can be diff something different there. Now, what do we mean by unilateral contract? Now, this is the kind of contract that involves the offeror making a promise to provide benefit when a certain act is completed. Most contracts are bilateral contracts. Um, so both parties make promises. For example, I will clean your windows if you pay me £10. There's an offer which can be accepted, so a contract exists even before the window cleaning starts. Now, in a unilateral contract, there's only one person making the promise. If I advertise a £20 reward for the return of my lost cat, for example, uh, there might well be a, n a number of people who will promise to try and find the cat and claim the reward, but there's no contract until a person is able to deliver the cat. Okay, so initially we've just got one person making the promise. Someone is doing something um, which then forms an acceptance, if you like. Now, the, the leading case here is a case called Carlyle and Carbolic Smokeball Company, which is a precedent about unilateral contracts through advertisements. It's an old 19th century case. The Smokeball Company were makers of this kind of medicine which, when inhaled, allegedly cured a whole range of illnesses, including influenza. The advertisement for the smoke ball said that the defendants would pay £100 to anyone who used their products and still caught the flu. Um, when Mrs. Carlyle purchased her smoke ball and used it as instructed, followed the instructions, like the advert says, she gets the flu and she claims her £100. Um, in the Court of Appeal, Bowen LJ, Lord Justice Bowen, held that a unilateral contract, a unilateral contract had been formed. Okay, um, he said we were asked to say that this contract was too vague to be enforced. But the answer to that argument seems to be that if a person chooses to make extravagant promises of this kind, he probably does so because it pays him to make them. The extravagance of the promises is no reason in law why he should not be bound by them. Can an offer be terminated? There are various ways in which an offer can be brought to an end. Um, it's rarely convenient to hold offers open forever. So let's think about delay, for instance. Um, if there's an excessive time between making an offer and receiving the acceptance, um, then what's going on there is that the offeror can regard the offer as having lapsed. Um, so, for example, in Ramsgate, Victoria and Montefiore, an offer to sell some shares had lapsed, that offer had lapsed, um, because by the time acceptance was received, it was 14 days later, and both sides would have known that the value of the shares, the stock market value of the shares, might have altered very significantly in that time, or, you know, significantly anyway. So delay can, can terminate an offer. And, and something else that can terminate an offer is a counter offer. Now, a counter offer destroys the original offer. For, for an acceptance, you've got to have the offer in its entirety being accepted. Anything else must be seen as a rejection of the offer or making a counter offer that makes the original offeree become the offeror. Okay, so a uh, counter offer is where the original offeree comes the offeror. In Hyde and Wrench, a farm was offered to sale, uh, for sale, sorry, um, by A to B um, at a price of a thousand pounds. B, the offeree, said, how about 950 pounds? And A refuses that offer. The offeree then tries to accept the original offer of a thousand pounds, but the court held that the original offer had been destroyed by the counter offer of 950. Revocation can also terminate, what's called revocation can also terminate um, an offer. Uh, this is about withdrawing an offer before it's been accepted, provided that this withdrawal or revocation has been communicated effectively to the offeree, then there's no longer an offer to accept. This rule has been extended to communication via a reliable third party as well. Now, what about the rules on communication of acceptance? Um, 
what what's the big deal there why is this significant when an acceptance takes effect is important because it identifies as i think we touched on earlier on when exactly a contract has been created the normal rule is that an acceptance takes effect when it's communicated to the offeror but there are important exceptions to that rule and i'll explain those in a moment just before i do that um can i just say that if you want to have a look at some of the other learn loads law videos please follow the links here um, so exceptions to the rule that acceptance takes effect when it's communicated to the offeror exception number one the postal rule the case there is Adams and Lims oh, sorry Adams and Linsell acceptance by letter takes effect when the letter is posted I'll say that again acceptance by letter takes effect when the letter is posted not when the offeror receives the letter or reads it okay can be tricky exception number two other methods of communicating acceptance are like telephone and email communication in relation to telephone communication the postal rule does not apply a person making the acceptance will know if the communication was not received and will need to try again in relation to emails uh, the case law is somewhat convoluted but if we look at a case called Thomas and and BPE that's uh, 2010 in that case the High Court said although it was only obita that the postal rule did not apply to emails um, the ordinary rules apply and acceptance takes effect when the acceptance is received um, although the court said that received meant in an inbox not when it's actually been read exception number three an acceptance may be implied from conduct um, Brogdon and Metropolitan Railway Company a coal me merchants offer a coal merchants offer was judged to have been accepted because the customer accepted a number of deliveries of coal from the merchant even though he would not actually said that he accepted the offer exception number four consumer contract and cooling off periods and now this is about the consumer protection regulations 2013 that apply to consumer contracts made over the telephone uh, internet post or through a catalog instead of at the business premises of the trader concerned where these regulations apply consumers have a cooling off period after the acceptance when they can change their mind and withdraw from the contract notice that some consumer contracts are excluded from these regulations um, so con uh, consumer contracts relating to financial services sale of land and contracts for transport do not have an automatic cooling off period at least not under these regulations I hope that was helpful um, please do feel free to click the little like button put any comments you might have on the uh, comments below uh, or subscribe to learn loads you can even visit my website learnloads.com um, for more help with law and even for that matter business studies too. lots of playlists with business studies topics thank you very much bye